Hi, everyone. Um, it looks like we're just about to get started as it's 2 o'clock. Um, thank you all for attending uh, this webinar on community choice aggregation and solar development. Um, my name is Danny Falk with the Solar Foundation, um, and I'll be managing uh, some of the technical aspects uh, behind the scenes, as well as moderating uh, this webinar and giving a short introduction to some of our other panelists who have uh, graciously uh, devoted some of their time here today to speak about uh, CCAs and their role in developing solar. Um, so we're very excited to speak with you guys and uh, let's get started. So just a short agenda uh, regarding um, how this uh, webinar is going to be uh, going. Um, uh, first, I'll be giving an introduction to SoulSmart, as I mentioned, which is the uh, program that uh, this webinar has been created for. Um, and then uh, after that, I'll be handing it over to Megan Lynch and Ben Butterworth from the Cadmus Group, and they'll be giving uh, their own introduction of uh, community choice aggregation. Um, obviously, we know uh, some some of our attendees will be in, in different places. Uh, this might be useful for uh, some individuals. For some individuals, it may be something that uh, they might already know in their sleep, or they feel like they've seen the same slide deck, uh, you know, a thousand times. But we think it's useful to just go through a short introduction on um, on choice aggregation, what it's all about, um, and after that point, uh, uh, the will be bring it over to. Uh, Marine Clean Energy, also known as MCE, um, in uh, California, and Jenna, who will be speaking about uh, MCE's experience um, with the CCAs, they themselves being a CCA. Um, and then after that, Jenna will throw it over to uh, another example of the CCA, uh, which is in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, she'll be throwing it over to uh, Megan, and we'll be talking about their experience. And uh, at that point, uh, I'll be talking a little bit more again um, regarding uh, other examples of CCAs and then a Q&A &A session and uh, a couple examples of uh, some of the uh, of our future webinar that we'll be doing next month, as well as some resources regarding CCAs that might be useful to view. Uh, so with that in mind, we'll get right into it. Um, so just a little bit of information about uh, our program, which is putting on this webinar. Uh, we're the Soul Smart program. Um, we're funded through uh, the U.S. Department of Energy Solar Energy Technologies Office. Our goal as a program is to help governments make uh, faster, easier, more affordable for businesses to go solar, um, usually by targeting what we call the soft cost of solar, so things like permitting, inspection, and uh, zoning code issues, other issues like that, anything the communities are looking to decrease uh, the non, uh, we'll just call it hardware manufacturing costs of the solar systems themselves. We help uh, communities deal with those sorts of issues. Um, our program is open to uh, US municipalities, uh, counties and regional organizations across the country. Um, how our program works is we um, designate communities that uh, fulfill certain criteria or amounts of criteria um, that we think are useful to put communities within best practices for solar development. Um, and we have three different levels, gold, silver, and bronze designation-wise that we award to communities when they've reached these specific criteria levels. Um, in order to help uh, communities um, implement these uh, criteria and best practices, we provide technical assistance at no cost to those communities. Um, these are a few of the communities that we work with um, on the technical assistance and designation program side. Um, as mentioned, these are a few of the sole smart categories that we work on. Um, so as mentioned, permitting inspection, um, planning, zoning, and development, um, lots of different issues that we work on um, on the soft cost side to help communities uh, uh, develop more solar if that's within their goals. Um, and just as an acknowledgement and disclaimer um, that this work is based on support from the Department of Energy under an award um, and that this work is uh, not guaranteed or expressly uh, um, 
claimed responsibility wise by the US government. Um, and uh, that's sort of uh, legal language as you can see on this. Um, so with all that in mind, and a little bit of background on, on why, why uh, we're putting this webinar on today, um, I'll throw it over to uh, Megan Lynch, um, and she and her colleague uh, Ben will be speaking a little bit about uh, CCAs and what they're all about, how they run, and some of the basic um, factors to consider in uh, CCA development. Thanks, Danny. Um, and hi, everyone. I'm Megan. I'm an analyst at the Cadmus Group, and I am joined by my colleague Ben Butterworth, who is a senior associate at Cadmus. Um, and as Danny mentioned, we'll be providing an overview of CCA, uh, including how it works and other considerations for establishing or participating in a CCA program. Uh, and then we'll be passing it over to our speakers from MCE and Cambridge Community Electricity. Um, so before we dive in, we wanted to just take a quick poll to get a sense of how familiar this group is with Community Choice Aggregation or CCA. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, uh, please just take a quick minute to fill out the following poll to describe your community's experience with CCA to date. And Danny, feel free to flip to the responses when you feel it's ready. Yep, absolutely. So I'll, I'll jump in real quick. And it looks like to give everyone a sense of where the poll numbers are at right now, we've got about 58% of people voting. So we'll give everyone, say, another 20 seconds or so to vote on um, where they are at um, with CCAs in their community. Okay, so I'll close the poll numbers uh, real quick. Um, it looks like, just to give everyone a sense of where we're at, um, it looks like we've had about 34% of individuals who are not actively pursuing CCA at this point in time, um, and then another 28% that are in discussions, and then the third uh, most selected option are um, CCA is not being allowed within the state. Um, so those seem to be the three overwhelming options. Um, Interestingly enough, uh, we don't have any responses um, from anyone who who uh, is saying a well established CCA program, which is definitely an interesting um, <laughs> interesting uh, finding. Um, I guess with that in mind, um, go back to our regular slides real quick. Thanks, Danny. All right, thank you. And thank you everyone for sharing. That's really helpful context for us to have as we dive into the presentation. Um, so to start, Community Choice Aggregation or CCA is a strategy enabled by state legislation that provides municipalities greater control over their energy supply by allowing a local government or multiple local governments working together to pool the electricity load of residents and businesses within the community and procure electricity on their behalf. And so the most common reason for establishing a CCA is the possibility of obtaining more competitive electricity rates uh, as a result of bulk purchasing and local control. However, a growing number of local governments are establishing CCAs as a way to increase the percentage of their electricity supply met by solar and other renewable sources. Uh, so this graphic here on the bottom right is just a simple illustration of how CCA works. Uh, so on the left, you have the CCA, which is responsible for purchasing electricity from suppliers on behalf of the community from either fossil fuel or renewable energy sources. In the middle is the utility, and so the utility's role will remain largely the same in terms of transmission, distribution, and billing customers, but they'll no longer be involved in selling electricity to members of the CCA program. 
Uh, and on the right, you have customers who will continue to receive electricity in the same way uh, while potentially benefiting from more affordable rates uh, and cleaner energy. Uh, and lastly, I will just note that we will be using the term community choice aggregation or CCA throughout this presentation but there are other common terms for this strategy that you may come across. So we've listed a few here, including municipal aggregation, community choice energy, and local energy aggregation, uh, among others. Um, so next slide. Thank you. So uh, implementing a CCA program can provide numerous benefits to communities but it can also present a few potential challenges so we wanted to just take a minute to walk through what some of the key benefits and challenges to be aware of are uh, so to start the most popular reason as i mentioned for establishing a cca program is the potential to leverage bulk purchasing power and local control to negotiate rates that are more competitive than basic service rates offered by the utility Additionally, CCAs will often enter into longer term contracts with suppliers, which can provide customers with rates that are not only competitive, but are also stable. Um, but a potential challenge to be aware of with this is that once the CCA executes its contracts with suppliers and locks into rates, it is possible that the utility's basic service rate will drop below that of the CCA for some period of time, which could result in customers ultimately leaving the CCA and returning to basic service. Uh, a second benefit is that CCAs give communities greater control over their energy supply, uh, which gives them the power to increase the percentage of their electricity supplied by solar and other renewable sources. Uh, and so while this is a really great benefit of CCA, it is important to note that depending on state and local market context, it can be challenging for a CCA to move beyond procuring renewable energy through unbundled RECs, uh, especially in early years of operation, which can raise questions about additionality and the extent to which this procurement, su procurement supports the creation of new or additional renewable energy sources. Um, and this is something that we'll get into a little bit more later on. Uh, a third benefit is that the local control that the CCA provides also allows communities to be more directly involved in energy related decisions and set their own priorities. Uh, and a similar benefit of this local control is greater consumer protection because local governments are able to vet suppliers on behalf of their residents. Um, but conversely, a potential challenge with, associated with this local control uh, is the potential for maybe some negative public response. Uh, some residents and businesses could potentially feel that CCA is an overreach or potentially a poor use of city staff time and resources. And lastly, there are economic benefits associated with establishing a CCA. Uh, so besides the transmission and distribution charges that will continue to be paid to the utility, uh, ratepayer revenue generated from the CCA will typically remain within the community and can be utilized to develop local renewable energy projects or otherwise be used to invest in the community in some other way. Um, but on the flip side, depending on the structure of the CCA, it is possible that local governments may need to invest some resources towards administrative costs. Um, so this is just a high level summary of some of the key benefits and challenges associated with establishing a CCA, but we will dive a bit deeper into each of these topics uh, in Ben's portion of the presentation. Um, so next slide. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it is generally necessary for a state to pass CCA enabling legislation before a community can establish a CCA program. Uh, so as of 2020, CCAs have been authorized via state level enabling legislation in nine states, which are highlighted in orange on this map. Uh, and according to the Local Energy Aggregation Network, they are being investigated in at least five states, which are highlighted in dark gray on this map. Uh, so we can go to the next slide. So an important nuance that we wanted to highlight is that the structure and role of the CCA program will largely depend on whether it's operating in a regulated or deregulated electricity market context. Uh, so we just wanted to pro provide a quick refresh on what these market contexts are. Uh, so to Utilities in regulated market contexts will maintain jurisdiction over all grid functions, which are shown here on the graphic on the slide. 
Uh, so this includes generation, which is owning and operating facilities that generate electricity, transmission, which is owning and operating the power lines and other infrastructure that helps carry electricity over long distances, uh, and third, distribution, which is owning and operating infrastructure to distribute electricity to end use customers. Um, and so in a fully regulated market, the utility maintains all of these functions and utility is also a customer's only option for purchasing electricity. Uh, but if you go one more slide, you'll see that in deregulated electricity markets, utilities are not permitted to own and operate power plants that generate electricity and that retail customers are free to purchase electricity from a competitive supplier. Uh, this is also known as retail choice. Uh, and the utility continues to provide transmission and distribution services. Um, so next slide. So as you can maybe guess, CCAs are more common in states with deregulated electricity markets uh, because utilities have already divested ownership in generation activities and their role as a transmission and distribution company is already well established. Um, so on this map, you will see that deregulated states or those with retail choice are dark blue, while regulated states or those with no retail choice are this medium blue, um, and partially deregulated states um, or those with partial retail choice are this light blue. Um, and Danny, if you click one more time, you'll see that currently almost all states with CCA enabling legislation uh, or states marked with these gold stars have deregulated electricity markets with the exception of Virginia and California, which are both partially deregulated. Um, and we just wanna note that CCAs in these partially regulated markets, such as California and Virginia, um, might be subject to various utility regulations that don't apply to CCAs in deregulated markets. Uh, so for example, they may be required to enter into long-term contracts with electricity generators, um, or comply with clean power mandates. So it's something to be aware of that CCAs in those states will slightly will function slightly differently. Um, okay, so next slide. Uh, so once enabling legislation has been passed, local governments are key to establishing a CCA program. Uh, and so while the process is going to vary from state to state, a local jurisdiction will generally take some or all of the steps identified on this graphic. Um, so step one will generally involve municipal staff conducting research about CCA and its potential role. Uh, so this could include a feasibility study, independent research, meeting with energy supply companies. Um, and I'll also note that local governments are welcome to support or welcome to consult with the SoulSmart technical assistance team for resources and additional support uh, at this stage in the process. Uh, next, you'll need local approval. So a city or county will need to gain local approval to authorize the CCA program. Uh, local approval requirements will vary from state to state and community to a com community to community. Uh, but I do want to note that if multiple communities pursue a CCA together, they will typically each need the individually authorized CCA through their respective processes. Um, at this point in the process, communities will want to consider engaging a broker. Uh, so a local government could choose to hire an energy broker to assist in the design, implementation, and monitoring of an energy aggregation plan. Uh, so the broker will act as an intermediary between the energy suppliers and the CCA itself and will arrange contracts between the two parties uh, and is typically compensated through a small fee per kilowatt hour consumed. Uh, so next you'll need to create a plan. Uh, so at this point, the municipality and potentially the energy broker will develop a CCA plan demonstrating how the CCA program will function. So we'll outline key information such as the financial plan, customer rights, uh, and the procurement plan. And then once this plan is created, you'll need to gain plan approval. So the plan will likely need to be voted on at a city council or town meeting. Um, additionally, it will likely need to be submitted to the Department of Public Utilities or an equivalent body before proceeding. Um, and then once you have plan approval, the next step would be to select suppliers. So in this step, the municipality or energy broker will issue an RFP for energy suppliers asking for different supply and term options. 
and will then enter into an agreement with one or multiple suppliers. Uh, and then the next step is to notify customers. So once suppliers have been selected and contracted, all impacted customers are notified of the supply chain and are change uh, and are offered the opportunity to opt out before enrollment begins. Uh, and then the last step is enrollment. So customers who did not opt out will be automatically enrolled in the CCA after a chosen time frame. Uh, the electricity will be distributed and billed through the original utility. Delivery charges will be paid to the utility while the power charges are paid to the supplier and customers will continue to receive electricity while potentially benefiting from lower and more stable rates with cleaner electricity. Uh, so with that, I am now going to pass it over to my colleague, Ben, to discuss some CCA program models. Thanks, Megan. Um, yeah, so as Megan mentioned earlier, my name is Ben Butler, um, and I work with Megan at the Canvas Group. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit about CCA program models. Um, Next slide, please. Um, so CCAs vary a lot from state to state and community to community. Um, so several key differences in CCA program models. I'll be, I'll be discussing a few. Um, geographic territory, enrollment options, product offerings, and renewable energy procurement strategies. Next slide, please. So starting off with geographic territory, so CCA is very widely in size. Um, so they're ranging from multiple counties, including several large cities, um, to single small towns running their own CCAs. Um, so the image on the left, that is uh, MCE in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, it's an example of a CCA that spans across multiple counties. Um, so in California, what is known as the Joint Powers Authority, um, which is an independent public agency that operates a CCA on behalf of member municipalities. It's, it's a common legal structure for multi-jurisdictional programs. So city councils in respective municipalities vote to work together to form a CCA. Um, so CCAs in California are typically formed under this kind of JPA model. Um, on the right, you see a Massachusetts example. Um, so each municipality in Massachusetts that wants to form a CCA, um, they choose to form a CCA and then they kind of form their own independent CCA for that city or that town. Um, so there's over 100 individual CCAs in Massachusetts. Um, in some states and other examples, you know, a couple of cities or a few towns will work together to form a CCA um, to get some of those economies to scale by working across multiple cities. Um, so just thinking about this kind of like size comparison, so there's a, there's a wide range in the number of customers served by an individual CCA. Um, so in California, because you have these multi-county um, CCAs, you know, you have several CCAs in California that serve over a million customers. Um, where in other parts of the country, you may have a CCA that's single, serving a single town of, you know, population of 10,000 or 15,000, let's say. Next slide. Um, so when a CCA is launched, there's really two options uh, for enrollment of customers. So the first option is opt out. Um, so residents would receive notification in mail of the CCA launch. And so the default would be to participate in the CCA. That would be kind of the default option these customers would receive. They would also have an opt out option. Opt out meaning they could opt out of the CCA and stay with their current provider, which would typically be a utility. Uh, so this is the vast majority of CCAs, and, and the real advantage here is it, it tends to drive higher rates in enrollment um, since this is the default option. So high enrollment is really key to successful CCA business model. Um, helps to make rates competitive. Um, when you have a lot of customers participating in the CCA, you can really achieve those economies of scale. Um, so customers can stay with their current provider in an opt-out model um, if they so choose, but again, the default option is to participate in the CCA. Um, so the opposite of that is the opt-in model, which is shown on the right there. Residents would receive notification in the mail of the CCA launch. The default in this case would be to stay with the current provider, uh, typically utility. And then they would also have the opt-in option. So they could opt in to participate in the CCA. Um, so opt-in is rare among CCAs. The, the key disadvantage is it tends to drive lower rates in enrollment since it's not the default option. So when you have low enrollment, it makes the business case for CCA a bit more challenging. Um, you have lower aggregated demand, you have weaker economies of scale, and it's more challenging for the CCA to offer competitive rates that attract customers. So the opt-in enrollment program, um, it can be a real barrier to CCA formation. Um, so most states have legislation enabling um, CCAs under the opt-out model. 
Um, however, some states like Ohio, you need approval from majority of voters and jurisdiction to agree to the opt-out CCA. Um, historically, for many states, including New Jersey, CCAs were not were only available on an opt-in basis. And once rules changed in those states, like in New Jersey, and it, it changed to an opt-out model, CCAs have really begun to proliferate in New Jersey. So it's a, it's a kind of key distinction that really um, can have a, a large impact on the success of a CCA. Next slide. Um, so CCAs typically offer a few different product offerings. Um, these are electricity products I'm referring to. Um, so the different offerings are really different levels of renewable energy content. So more renewable energy content is typically more expensive per kilowatt hour. So depending on the local market conditions and legislation, um, CCAs can offer more competitive rates than a utility in many cases. And they can often offer more competitive rates and higher renewable energy content simultaneously, which when that's the case, it's a very appealing offer to potential customers that they can get both cheaper rates and more renewable energy content. Um, so this table on this slide is an example from the city of Somerville in Massachusetts. Um, so Eversource is the electric utility in Somerville. Um, so on the far left, you have what is the standard or default offering under Somerville's uh, CCA, which is the Somerville local green option. Um, customers can also opt up to the Somerville 100% local green option, which is second from the left there in the table. And customers can also opt down meaning they choose to participate in the Somerville basic product, which is the third column from the left. Um, they can also completely opt out, which is the far right option. And opting out in this case means staying with Eversource, their provider um, prior to the CCA launching. Um, so if you look at the residential customers in Somerville, um, the basic CCA service, it's really the same renewable energy content as the Eversource product offering, but it's also 18% less of a rate, a lower rate than the Eversource rate. Local green in this example, um, you get an extra 10% of class one RECs or renewable energy over the Eversource offering, um, but that one is also 15% less in cost than the Eversource rate per kWh. And then the 100% local green option that's offered to the Somerville CCA, it's extra 100% in class one RICs over the Eversource offering. And it's only it's slightly more than the Eversource rate. It's 6% higher than the Eversource rate. So that's just one example uh, of a CCA in Massachusetts to kind of think about the different, different product offerings you can have through a CCA. Um, but the rates and the kind of individual structures of the products will change from CCA to CCA and state to state. Next slide. So how do CCAs typically go about obtaining renewable electricity so they can offer renewable electricity products? Um, so typically CCAs will secure renewable electricity supply through the purchase of RECs or renewable energy credits. Um, so these are tradable market-based instruments that represent the legal rights to the environmental and social attributes of one megawatt hour of renewable electricity generation. So there's two main types of RECs. So you have bundled RECs, which is the top example on this slide. So this is when the REC and the physical electricity, or what's known as the commodity energy, generated by a specific renewable energy project are sold together. So for example, a CCA signs a purchase power agreement with a solar developer, and it buys both the megawatt hours of physical electricity or the commodity energy, which is the blue box, and the associated REC from the solar developer, which is the green box. And they buy those, the, the blue box and the green box together. Um, unbundled RECs, it's the example on the bottom. Um, this is when the REC uh, and the physical electricity or the commodity energy generated by a specific renewable energy product are sold separately. So for example, uh, a wind farm in Texas may sell the physical electricity or the commodity energy on the wholesale market in Texas, but that same wind farm could also sell the RECs to a community choice aggregation in Massachusetts or some other state. Next slide. Um, so a little bit more on unbundled versus bundled RICs. Um, so unbundled RICs are those that are sold, delivered, or purchased separately from physical electricity. So many CCAs across the country rely on unbundled RICs as the primary means of increasing the renewable 
percentage of the electricity product delivered to customers. So some key advantages of unbundled RECs, um, they can be sourced from renewable energy projects across the region or across the country, and they're relatively low cost and simple to procure. Um, some key disadvantages, uh, Unbundled RECs are often criticized for capitalizing on the presence of existing renewable energy projects and not driving the development of new or what's known as additional renewable energy projects that would not have otherwise been built. Um, so not all unbundled RECs are created equal. It's something important to keep in mind and it's really dependent on the specifics of the REC and the local REC market context. Um, bundled RECs, um, in contrast to unbundled RECs, um, are sold together with the physical electricity generated by a specific renewable energy project. Uh, bundled RECs and their associated clean electricity are typically procured by CCAs through power uh, purchase power agreements or PPAs. Um, so some key disadvantages, um, they're often considered, um, or sorry, some key advantages, they're often considered to drive the development of new or what's known as additional renewable energy projects that would not have otherwise been built. Um, key disadvantages, um, identifying and contracting electricity bundled with RECs can be a little more administratively burdensome from the standpoint of the CCA, um, and it can also be more expensive to procure than unbundled RECs in some cases. Next slide. Right, so this just shows um, kind of different procurement strategies and kind of how CCAs can start at a more kind of basic model and over time they have the potential to kind of advance into more uh, advanced offerings. So step one, which is kind of that uh, center bullseye piece there, is kind of your basic CCA model using RECs. Um, a lot of CCAs start off by primarily relying on unbundled RECs um, and having a pretty simple business model. Um, step two is you kind of move to the outer rings. It's a more advanced renewable energy procurement strategies. So over time, CCAs can reduce the reliance on RECs if they so choose and more directly support renewable energy projects. Um, so examples of this are moving towards PPAs or direct contracts between a CCA and renewable energy developers. Um, step three in this example, is demand energy response programs and incentives. Um, so offering alternative renewable energy programs to customers, including things like community solar, um, a CCA can operate as a centralized hub promoting these programs. Um, a good example of this is Westchester Power in New York, which is offering some innovative programs and promoting community solar in their region. Um, and finally, step four is um, we categorize it as a additional offerings. There's a lot you could put under here, but it's really just moving beyond just um, the electricity supply component of a CCA. So using res revenue generated by CCAs to deploy various programs um, that pilot and incentivize certain technologies. So air source heat pumps, electric vehicles, EV charging stations, other technologies. Um, and a lot of the CCAs in California are moving towards this type of model. Um, so speaking of CCAs in California, um, I'll pass the mic over to Jenna Famular, who will be talking about some of the innovative programs uh, the MCE is offering to advance solar uh, at MCE. Thank you so much for that great overview. That's one of the best overviews of CCAs I've ever heard. So. <laughs> Um, I'm going to be talking just a little bit about um, MCE and highlighting just two of our programs that offer opportunities for uh, local solar development um, and local renewable development. So we'll move on to the next slide. So just a quick overview of who MCE is. Um, we are California's first community choice agency. Um, the legislation in California passed back in 2002 and MCE formed in 2008 under the name Marin Energy Authority. Um, in 2010, we started serving customers in Marin County where we first launched to approximately 8,000 accounts. In 2013, we expanded to our first community outside of Marin, which was the city of Richmond in Contra Costa County across the Bay. And as of 2020, we have completed our most recent enrollment of unincorporated Solano County and are serving over 480,000 customer accounts. Um, so we are a joint powers authority model um, serving 34 member communities, although we do have two new communities enrolling next spring. Um, so we'll be 36 at that time. 
And we offer our customers a variety of energy services and programs. Um, we offer incentives for um, installation of solar, for electric vehicles, for electric vehicle charging stations. We also offer a suite of energy efficiency services and programs, including some pilot programs on um, heat pump water heaters and um, electrification for folks up in Napa County who were impacted by the fires a couple years back. Um, but our basic services, um, we offer three electric service options, one of which is um, really a program that I'll talk about. But our basic service option, we are an opt out model. So customers in our communities are automatically enrolled in our light green 60% renewable service. It is a minimum of 60% renewable and we are 90% carbon free right now. Um, we'll be moving towards 95% carbon free by 2022. And um, that service is generally the same or less expensive than the incumbent utility service um, and twice as renewable. We also offer our deep green service option, which is 100% renewable. And the power for that service option is 100% California wind and solar resources. And then our local soul service option is also a program. It's it's um, similar to a community solar model, um, but that's sort of a new newer model in California. So this program, um, I'll talk a little bit about what that looks like. So we can move on to the next slide. Um, just to give you a sense, uh, since MCE launched in 2010, we've helped our customers eliminate over 340,000 metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions, saved customers over $68 million in rate savings, and committed over $1.6 billion to build new California renewable projects, including 31 megawatts of new projects built in our service area, primarily through our feed-in tariff program, which I am going to talk about now on the next slide. So. Our feed-in tariff program um, comes in two versions, a what we call FIT and FIT Plus. Um, so these projects are um, standardized 20-year contracts at a fixed price per megawatt hour generated. And the program has had some changes on that pricing model since it first launched. Um, there were 12 conditions with two megawatts in each condition. So as you move down through the conditions, the pricing model steps down uh, $5 per megawatt hour as each condition is filled. So for this program, the FIT program, um, the projects are between zero and one megawatt in size. Um, we, I think our smallest project um, is 265 kilowatts and really it's just a matter of what pencils out. Um, one of the reasons that we started this program is because as a community choice provider, our focus is really on providing benefits to our communities. Um, our mission is to reduce electricity related greenhouse gas emissions, but part of that is building renewable energy in our service area, developing, um, you know, workforce opportunities and stimulating the local economy. And being in the Bay Area, the cost of land is extremely high, so it is prohibitive for these local renewable projects, which are generally small in scale because of, again, the way that the Bay Area is located, most of the land is already developed um, or is um, restricted, uh, it's preserved land. So this program helps incentivize um, development because we're offering above market rate prices for these contracts. So for these programs, the requirements are that they are in MCE service area. So we saw that map earlier, they have to be within that area. They all have prevailing wage requirements as defined by the California Labor Code, and um, they are all 50% local hire. Um, additionally, we just added a couple of new um, requirements. So for this program specifically, the zero to one megawatt program, the storage um, is required on new solar projects um, up to 40 or 40 percent of nameplate capacity so this is a new requirement um, most of our feed-in tariff projects are solar and so we wanted to bear in mind that um, you know solar in california is very abundant and we're having these negative prices during the day when solar is available and then this very large ramp in the evening 
Um, so looking at long-term sustainability for these renewable projects and helping um, the state get to that 100% renewable goal, um, we want to make sure that we're being thoughtful about storage and managing that load appropriately. Additionally, we added an urban infill adder for uh, $5 per megawatt hour for the first five years if you are using um, land that is already used for something else, so rooftop or carport structures. Additionally, non-solar, uh, non-base load that meets RPS, uh, Renewable Portfolio Standard uh, resources, is also eligible for a $7 per megawatt hour adder. Um, and then lastly, we just added this, we're very excited. Um, we require pollinator friendly habitat throughout um, all new solar projects. And this is not just specific to our feed-in tariff program, it's for our um, power purchase agreements as well. So um, these developers are required to submit a pollinator scorecard with a score above 70 every three years to prove that they are meeting these requirements. Um, so we have some additionality there of promoting um, local pollinators and uh, local environmental um, and land use practices. Okay, next slide. So this is to give you a sense of the pricing. Um, so conditions one through eight, which would be 16 megawatts are already filled. Um, so we did start off with a pricing structure that was based on the time of use pricing um, and then moved out of that structure a little while back to make things a little bit easier for the contracting purposes and payment purposes. Um, so we do have several megawatts left in these conditions and you can see over time, as I mentioned, as the conditions became filled, the incentive prices have gone down. And the intent here is really um, similar to how energy efficiency um, incentives work in California is that we want to encourage folks to get in early and then as things become more commonplace those incentives step down and become closer to the market rate value. Um, next slide. So this is our FIT Plus program, a very similar 20-year contract, uh, prices step down per megawatt as the conditions are filled, um, but this is for projects between one and five megawatts. Um, so there were only four conditions in this program. We have filled three of them. So condition four is still open um, with two megawatts available and um, very similar requirements. Um, the compensation for the storage is a little bit higher, $10 per kilowatt per kilowatt month uh, for the first 10 years. And then um, similar adder for the um, non-solar resources. So um, we found that there were a number of projects that were um, outside of the scope of FIT that um, we wanted to still provide incentives for, but um, have a little bit different you know, conditions being that they're larger and do have some economies of scale or increased economies of scale because of that. Um, so we created this new program uh, about a year or so ago. Um, so right now, we are moving towards full subscription of these programs, um, as I mentioned, 31 megawatts of new local projects. We do also partner um, on other projects. For example, we have a landfill gas to energy project that we partnered with, with, with waste management at a landfill in Novato, uh, up in Marin County. And that is not through our FIT program, it's a power purchase agreement. So there are other ways that we incentivize um, local development by going through power purchase agreements. Um, but this is really our really unique program to work with smaller developers and um, be really actively involved in these processes. Um, okay, we'll move on to the next slide and the next project. Oh, actually, sorry. This is just a quick list of some of these projects. So as I mentioned, a lot of them are through our FIT program. Um, you can see the Redwood Landfill project that I just mentioned is number six on here. Um, and then these other PPAs are larger projects that are local projects, but that were built sort of in unique circumstances. So um, the Buck Institute uh, in up in Novato, again, in Marin County, they um, were building this regardless. So they wanted to sell us the power. We were happy to take that and help them through that process. So one of the things that we do um, with these power purchase agreements is what we call quickening. Um, where we make it more financially feasible for these projects to come online either faster um, or in fact at all because we are willing to buy the power which helps these um, projects get financing. 
Um, MCE Solar One uh, was a project um, in Richmond. It's a 10 and a half megawatt project on the Chevron refinery brownfield site. Um, so this was a really unique partnership between Chevron, the city of Richmond and MCE. Um, and then the solar charge project down there is actually MCE's um, offices in San Rafael. We put in a solar carport with 10 EV charging stations. This was a grant that we received from the Air District um, to help promote um, some of these projects. So the next step on that is gonna be installing solar so we can really um, have this case study project for all of these integrated technologies um, at our own offices in San Rafael. So we're very excited about that. Okay, next slide. Um, here's an example of one of our feed-in tariff projects. Um, so San Rafael Airport, this was our first um, feed-in tariff project, uh, supported 21 jobs. We worked with local workforce development partners, and it's a one megawatt rooftop solar project. Next slide. And then this is um, a ground mount project in Richmond. Um, it's two one megawatt projects right next to each other. And um, also we worked with a local workforce development partner on this Richmond build um, to support 26 jobs um, and help this uh, Richmond build helps folks um, who are economically disadvantaged, primarily folks of color and often have a history with the justice system, develop new job skills in the, the green energy um, sector. Next slide. Okay, so this is the final example project that I have. This is um, Cooley Quarry, um, which is the project that uh, feeds into our local soul program. So this um, was a uh, one megawatt project on, again, a brownfield site up in Novato. Um, the service option is 100% locally sourced solar for approximately 300 customers. And I'll talk more about that program next. So next slide. So the local soul program, this project was originally built through our feed-in tariff program. Um, it was pulled out of that queue to become part, uh, to become what is our, our local soul program. So customers are offered the chance to directly support this local project um, and essentially have all of their energy generated from local solar without having to install solar on their home. Um, so we have a lot of folks up in Marin County that have subscribed to this program. There's a lot of old growth trees up there. So folks have rooftops that aren't um, solar friendly or there's also, um, you know, if you live in a condo, maybe you don't own your roof or maybe you don't have a roof, maybe you're on the first floor. So participating in a program like this allows you not only to have 100% renewable, but also 100% local. Um, so the original project price was $137 per megawatt hour. Customers pay 14.2 cents per kilowatt hour. Um, so what that encompasses is the 13.7 cents for the actual project price and then a half cent administrative cost. Um, this is compared to our light green service option, which is an average of 8.7 cents per kilowatt hour and deep green, which is an average of 9.7. Um, so it'll vary a little bit depending on what your rate class is. This is for a standard residential customer. Um, the local sold program, because it is a limited program, is limited to residential customers and very small commercial. Um, otherwise, it would fill up the entire program and we wouldn't have room for other folks. So this is kind of the structure of this program. Um, customers just enroll through our website. Um, we have approximately 200 customers enrolled um, right now. And uh, we have, I believe, one or two uh, commercial customers enrolled with very small usage accounts. Um, it's also a pretty expensive program, um, which does have that additionality of um, local renewable development, but it can be prohibitive from some customers. Um, we do also have the ability to expand this program. Um, if we had a lot of interest from customers, we would be able to potentially take one of those other feed-in tariff programs or develop a new project um, to contribute to this program. Um, and that might um, also adjust the pricing structure accordingly. So for example, if we were to take a project whose um, price had been $70 a megawatt hour, that would factor into this and bring the price down for customers. So there's a lot of options here. Um, this was our sort of um, first step at this, you know, offering customers some additionality and um, seeing where it goes. So we're excited um, over the past couple of years that we've had so many customers interested and we've had a lot of um, enrollments lately. So um, next slide. 
that is it for me. Um, so I'm going to pass it over to Megan Shaw um, from the Cambridge Energy Alliance. Thank you so much. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Cambridge Community Electricity Program, which is our community chat choice aggregation program for um, the city of Cambridge in Massachusetts. Um, but before I talk about the structure of our program, um, I did want to um, take a step back and um, talk a little bit about the, the planning and decision making that went into um, landing on a program structure. Next slide, please. So um, I, I would encourage any, any um, cities or towns or groups of towns to really consider what, what impact do they want an aggregation program to have prior to launching that aggregation program. Um, some aggregations, they're, they're, the goal for their, for their program is simply to save um, their participants money on their electricity bill. Um, they want to have stable lower rates than the utility. Um, other programs like we heard described um, put a strong focus on adding renewable energy um, by purchasing RECs and adding that to their supply whether that be national RECs or uh, local um, RECs. And, um, and of course, you know, as we saw in the last presentation, other other um, other aggregations have really been able to um, take their work even further and and start to do direct, you know, direct investment and direct procurement of electricity. So one thing that we did in the city of Cambridge was really thought through what are our renewable energy goals and criteria? What kind of renewable energy do we want to invest in? Not, not just for the aggregation, but just across the board, whether it's for our municipal electricity supply or whether it's for our community electricity aggregation supply. And the, the reason I'm sharing all this is because I think that it's very important to get your goals and impacts um, clear within your organization, within your within your city or town, prior to um, in, you know launching an aggregation. Um, not that you can't change it as you go along, but that it helps to get everyone on the same page. And this is a little bit about why the, the Cambridge aggregation actually has chosen um, not to buy RECs as the pathway for, for greening our electricity supply. Next slide, please. So um, before we even launched our aggregation, we did hire a facilitator to work um, across multiple departments, including our finance department, our um, administrative leadership, our law department, um, our community development department, our Department of Public Works to sit down and ex really explore what are the renewable energy values and goals and priorities for the city. And this, the outcome of this was to really create a formalized decision-making matrix for renewable energy purchases so that, you know, if we do a request for proposals, um, if we're looking to sign a power purchase agreement or when we're deciding how to structure programs like our aggregation, we can refer to this decision-making matrix. Next slide, please. So as you can see, you know, during this process of, of thinking through what are our goals and what, what, what kind of impact do we want our renewable energy investments to have, there was a lot of different, um, a lot of different goals and a lot of different priorities. And, um, and it really helped to have this be a, you know, across multiple departments to capture you know, all of these ideas in one place and, and get, get all of the teams that, that have some level of decision making you know, um, around these purchases um, in one place. Next slide, please. So the outcome of this was, um, this is a small look at the matrix that we came out with. Um, and you can see things like our purchasing goals are about displacing fossil fuels, making our net zero energy goals possible, um, having positive environmental and human health impacts. And then there's criteria around, you know, the, you know, financially, what criteria we have, equity criteria, environmental criteria. And this really helps drive the, the structure of our aggregation program. Next slide, please. 
So part of the reason why our aggregation program um, does not purchase um, RECs as a greening strategy, whether bundled or unbundled, is because this exercise in deciding our goals and criteria really helped us focus on the fact that the City of Cambridge wants um, our programs to create additional renewable energy generating capacity, um, new generating capacity being added to the grid. So we're, we're calling that additionality or impact. Um, and this is very different than the way RECs work. Um, they they, they uh, track renewable energy that is already existing on the grid and assign them um, to you know to an organization or an entity, but they don't um, but they don't they don't actually add um, new renewable generating capacity. So um, you're essentially purchasing the environmental attributes of an existing system. Um, so, so the RECs didn't fit into that additionality and impact category of our goals and criteria. And also, um, you know, we wanted to make a long-term commitment to a renewable energy project. Uh, RECs are, you know, um, they're sold, you know, year to year, month to month, but, um, you know, really to make, to make new projects come on, um, they need, they need to have long-term buyers of their um, environmental attributes, long-term buyers of the RECs, and th there was really no way to, to do that through a REC purchase. Um, our, our aggregation electricity supply is usually brokered every two years. Um, and so it's, it was it was kind of impossible to make a long-term commitment to a project on a two-year um, time scale. So, so based on this, this kind of pre-planning and really narrowing in on our goals, um, we, we have chosen um, not to buy RECs as part of our aggregation. And, and, and the message is not that, you know, you shouldn't buy RECs. The message is just to get clear about the goals for your aggregation before designing it. Next slide, please. So we we have um, come up with a this is a this is a interesting structure for um, for an aggregation in Massachusetts, um, and it involves this flowchart. Um, so I'm just going to walk through it. So the way the way that we've decided to structure our aggregation is by using an uh, a uh, an adder, an operational adder, which means that every kilowatt of electricity sold in our aggregation creates, um, actually is, you know, two hundredths of a cent, um, t sorry, two tenths of a cent more expensive than just the market rate um, that we've received from our supplier. And the reason we're collecting this operational adder is because we want to directly invest that adder into a new solar project that will be built within the city of Cambridge. Um, so this helps meet our additionality and impact as well as our long-term commitment goal because the city will build this project for our aggregation participants and own and operate it long-term. In addition, um, we are going to be retiring the RECs from this, pro this solar project um, so that the greenhouse gas emission credits, the, the, the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is directly credited you know, to our aggregation participants. So we collect, we collect the adder and we um, put it into a revolving fund that we created specifically for this purchase purpose. And every two years, that revolving fund um, is expected to collect around $1.2 million. Um, 2019 and 2020 are the first two years that we're trying this model. Um, so we have not, um, we've not actually built a solar project yet, um, but I'm just outlining the, the, the plan. Um, in addition to, you know, building, using that money to build the solar project, the fund, the fund will also be continually refreshed with even additional money beyond the adder after this first two years because we will be selling the net metering credits, we'll be selling the value of the electricity and redepositing that into the aggregation fund, um, revolving fund, so that we can build even more solar in the future. So um, we will be building the project and then we will be putting some of the money aside for um, maintenance, repair and decommissioning. We'll be retiring the RECs 
for on behalf of our participants and selling the net metering credits to add to their revolving fund and build new solar. And we we feel like this got around some of the uh, trickier parts of, of our goals, which is that we wanted to be able to say, yes, we've created a new renewable energy project. We've added new renewable energy directly to the grid. Um, we also are contracting with a local solar developer. So we are providing local jobs. We're keeping that renewable energy money kind of in our local economy, as opposed to sending it to a wind energy project in another state um, with unbundled recs. And we're giving all of our aggregation participants the opportunity to claim more environmentally friendly electricity because the adder is added onto every single kilowatt hour sold, regardless of whether the participant signs up for a standard product or um, our 100% green product. So it really makes it a default um, option for all of our community members. Next slide, please. Um, so even though I just told everyone about how we do not uh, automatically buy RECs for our um, aggregation participants, we still do offer a REC purchase option with our 100% Green Plus that gives people the option to opt up to 100% renewable electricity with Massachusetts Class 1 RECs. They also pay the operational adder towards the new solar projects. The, the reason that we still offer this option is because we know that there are certain customers within our community that want one, to claim 100% renewable electricity. And we felt that um, from a consumer protection standpoint and a consumer choice standpoint, we did want to offer our aggregation the participants the opportunity to buy um, Massachusetts Class 1 RECs, but we the city does not automatically buy RECs and in, in include it in any of our supply um, unless unless the customer opts into that option. Um, you know, we felt that participants might um, might go shopping for 100% renewable electricity elsewhere because there's a lot of confusion in the market and we really wanted to continue to keep them within our program um, for a variety of reasons. Um, and so we, we do offer this option. So there is some level of choice um, between the 100% green plus and the basic green. And like I mentioned, they all include the operational adder. So, so they're all, they're all, all of those um, customer participants are um, going to be taking advantage of the new local solar project by having their energy greened by that uh, solar project. Another advantage of aggregations, which people have already touched on, is that it does provide a steady year-round price without the seasonality of basic service prices, which in Massachusetts, in Eversource territory, change every six months. Um, even without having a crystal ball and being able to see into the future, we have been able to save um, our participants over $11 million when compared to basic service over the last three and a half years. So I think it's important when you're thinking about an aggregation again is to think about what are your what are your goals for those? Um, you know, do you just want to focus on savings? Do you want to guarantee some level of savings, um, but also offer green electricity, whether it's through, through a direct investment or RECs? Um, or, or do you want to, um, you know, really only offer um, green electricity that might come at, at a price premium? Um, the other thing that I think really helps in this in our deregulated market here in Massachusetts, where there are lots of competitive retail electricity suppliers that customers can receive, uh, you know, flyers in the mail and phone calls on their phone, um, is is really the customer protection that the city offers to our residents and, and businesses that participate. They know that the city has done a competitive procurement process for the electricity supply. They know that there's no contract um, with our program, that they can, they can opt out at any time with no, with no fees. Um, and I, that is actually very valuable um, in our market because there are, people are often inundated with electricity supply offers. Um, a lot of those supply offers are very much greenwashed. And some suppliers are actually quite predatory um, really, really um, 
starting with low introductory offers and then jacking up prices um, after people have stopped paying attention. So we we really like having the electricity the 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 electricity aggregation program because it it helps give people um, an opportunity to choose not to engage in the retail competitive supply market and also gives them a choice to not participate with um, in the utility rates as well. Next slide. Great, so this is the, that was the end of my presentation and I'll turn it back over to the SoulSmart team. All right, great, thank you very much, Megan. Uh, I appreciate uh, uh, your insight and all of our panelists' insight. Um, we are running a little bit over, so I'll have to run through our Q&A session real quick. Figured I'd just mention for anyone who's looking to um, make a quick exit or anything like that, that we will be putting uh, this webinar on our uh, Go Soul Smart YouTube page. Um, so it will be available in the future um, for future viewing. Um, but for anyone who's still interested and has some questions to ask, we're going to go through a quick Q&A session and give a little bit more information on resources. Um, so just a quick uh, run through on uh, possible uh, future locations on CCAs. Uh, uh, we've mentioned a couple states are looking at establishing CCAs. Uh, here are two examples of uh, Connecticut and Michigan looking at possibly using CCA for to reach uh, some of their uh, clean energy goals or uh, clean energy future. Um, we also have a few additional resources on um, as listed here, um, including uh, what we hope uh, you'll find to be a great issue brief uh, that was uh, um, written by the Cadmus Group um, as well, and then uh, edited by the Solar Foundation team uh, here. Um, also have a few other resources listed from uh, Lean Energy, NREL, and, uh, and CERTA. Um, and then just a quick uh, overview of other CCAs. Um, uh, the map on the left being from Clean Power Exchange, you can see a couple of different statuses um, uh, throughout California and where there's development going on. Um, obviously, you can see, uh, as mentioned, some of the areas that Marine Clean Energy is operating in. Um, and uh, their program being established there. Um, but you can also see the progress that's going on throughout other counties there. Um, and also listing another example of another CCA uh, in uh, Ohio, um, which is one of the earliest established CCAs. Um, just as a couple other examples of CCAs throughout the country, um, uh, if if you do uh, get if you do want to look at other examples in California, there's a big long list on cleanpowerexchange.com, um, listing out a, a long list of the CCAs that have been established or in progress throughout California. Um, so feel free to take a look at that. Uh, it's a good resource for um, just looking at what other CCAs have done. Um, so with that in mind, uh, we'll be giving everyone a minute or so if they have any questions or anything they're interested in, feel free to send a, a question our way. Um, hopefully uh, some, if not all of the panelists will have time despite us going over to stay on and help answer a couple questions that everyone's interested in. Um, so we'll give everyone a second and then uh, I'll throw it over to my colleague, uh, Avery Palmer with the Solar Foundation um, and he will be uh, presenting some of the questions that you guys send in. So uh, we appreciate your guys' interest and in, in, uh, your willingness to uh, ask uh, any questions you're interested in. Okay, well, this is Avery Palmer at the Solar Foundation. As Danny mentioned, we are a little over time. So if you do need to leave or if we aren't able to get to your question, um, please feel to contact either any of the individual speakers or get in touch with us at info at soulsmart.org. Uh, and we'd be happy to follow up. Again, that's info at soulsmart.org is the email address. But we'll have time to run through a couple of your questions. Um, 
A couple of related questions came in regarding the MC uh, FIT program, so I'll just ask them both at once. Um, one question is, is there a cost premium to customers as a result of the FIT programs? And the second question is, how is the MCE FIT program able to buck um, demand for shorter term PPAs of five to 10 years instead of 20 due to the changing prices of renewable energy? For example, contracts ex executed 10 years ago in Texas are now overpriced relative to current pricing. Great, thank you. Um, so can you remind me what the first question was again? Oh, price premiums. Sure. Um, right. I got it, I got it. <laughs> um, so no, customers do not pay a price premium. Um, MCE as a joint powers authority, we're a not-for-profit. So what that means is that any additional revenue that we have is reinvested in these programs. So um, of our revenue, about 90% uh, goes back into purchasing contracts on behalf of our customers. About 4% is overhead, um, staff, administrative services, our offices, things like that. So that remaining 6% is reinvested into the community through programs like our feed-in tariff program. So that's really where that revenue is coming from. Um, and I also did want to mention that our deep green service option, um, that additional penny adder per kilowatt hour goes directly into um, a fund that will fund local projects, programs, and services. It does not fund the feed-in tariff program, but our customers do have that additionality as well. Um, and then in terms of the contracting, um, as was mentioned earlier, MCE is in a partially deregulated um, energy market. So we are required to meet utility um, energy contracting in terms of long-term contracts, resource adequacy, and things like that. So um, it's part of the energy market that utilities and electric service providers are going to enter into long-term contracts that may not reflect the market price down the road. So it's, it's just part of the contracting process. Okay, thanks. Um, so this next one is maybe for Cadmus or anybody else who wants to jump in. How would you classify CCAs which have the authority to to sign renewable energy PPAs, such as in California, um, compared to those that do not, such as municipal aggregators in Illinois. Is there a term to describe each situation, and are there states other than California which allow CCAs to enter into direct PPAs? That is Ben from Cadmus. Um, yeah, I don't think there's an exact term for that. I mean, slide, um, the slide I showed that showed kind of the dartboard image on kind of the different um, steps of procurement strategies for PPAs, I think, or sorry, for CCAs kind of gets at this, um, where that kind of like step one, the kind of center of the dartboard, that basic CCA model, um, we were relying on unbundled recs, and then kind of step two was the kind of more advanced renewable energy procurement strategy, so PPA being one of those. Um, there are, PPAs are an option for, I know they're an option for CCAs in other states outside of California, um, I, and it's something that we've talked with CCAs outside of California as exploring as an option. I don't know of any that have actually taken that step. Um, but there are definitely um, quite a few CCAs in California that are pursuing that option. So it is an option available outside of California. Um, as you mentioned, in some states like Illinois, it might not be possible, um, but it, it is an option available to a lot of CCAs. Okay, and we should have time for one more question. Is there a difference between retail choice states and deregulated states? And if so, is there any impact on the state enabling legislation? I don't know if Canvas wants to try that one as well. Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, is there a difference between retail choice and deregulated states? And if there is a difference, is there any impact on the state's enabling legislation for CCAs? Um, they're, they're pretty similar terms. So um, states where there is deregulated electricity markets, there typically is a retail choice option. So it's, it's typically like a term similar terms for the same kind of concept where customers don't just have to buy electricity from one option, that being the 
um, you know, top-down monopoly utility. Um, so yes, they're, they're similar terms for the same uh, concept. Okay, thank you. Well, unfortunately, we can't get to all the questions, but again, we'd be happy to follow up if you'd like to send us an email, and we will also follow up with an email to all attendees that includes a link to the full recording of this webinar. Danny, do you have any closing thoughts before we adjourn the webinar? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we'll go through real quick um, some of uh, the upcoming information on the webinars. And uh, um, so we do have, this is actually part two of a series of webinars. Uh, we previously did a webinar on clean energy goals. Um, I believe that's up on, on the Ghost Soul Smart website. Um, uh, if not, it certainly will be uh, in the very near future, um, as will this webinar. Um, so feel free to take a look at that webinar, um, as well as uh, if there's anything you want to take a look at on this. Um, but uh, I mentioned this because uh, our third webinar and our final webinar in the series will be August 6th uh, from 2 to 3. Um, and it'll be detailing how local and regional governments can buy renewable energy and support market development. Um, so that's what's up uh, upcoming on the calendar. Um, just thought we'd mention it to everyone on here. Um, and then uh, again, just uh, if you're interested in, uh, in if uh, you're interested in getting your community to engage with SoulSmart, or you're interested in more information, um, we provide no cost technical assistance, as mentioned again, uh, to help achieve solar energy goals on things including CCAs. Um, and it's uh, no cost, as mentioned, um, and available to all municipalities, counties, and regional organizations in the United States. And if you have any more questions, feel free to get in contact with us again um, and uh, or with any of the panelists. Uh, feel free to uh, reach out and uh, hopefully we'll be able to answer any questions you have. But uh, I think that's pretty much it um, for this webinar. And we hope you'll join us uh, for the next webinar on August 6th. And just want to thank all of our panelists again for uh, taking the time to, to speak with all of our attendees and our attendees. Thank you for taking time out of your day um, to uh, uh, listen to us talk about CCAs. And uh, with that, I think we'll conclude the webinar and uh, just uh, thank you again uh, to everybody for your interest in this topic.